R. Kelly. Hey, how are you guys? RGB. I don't understand Spanish. You're right. Ya Pedro se trata. You said you wanted to translate RJB, my friend. Are you listening, RJB? Styly? RJB, Styly, you're listening? No matter what you do, I'm going crazy. I'd rather be alone. Okay. You said you wanted to translate my articles into Danish? What man? What's wrong with you, friend? RGB, are you okay? You're not are you okay today, my friend? You okay. Dutch, I'm sorry. Is that German? Is that what the Germans speak? They speak Deutsch? Dutch? Let's go, champ. Hey, that's what my buddy calls me. Okay, do you want okay? Let me just, do you want to translate my works into Dutch? Is that what you asked? Bruh, what's up, bro? Yeah, but you want to translate it? Is that what you want to do? David Kim is some Korean clown that became a Muslim, and for some reason, his YouTube channel went viral. Do you know why it went viral? Uh, RJB, if you want to start a website where you translate my articles in Dutch, you got my permission for the glory of Jesus Christ. So go ahead and do it. Keep the name of the author article and do it for the glory of Jesus Christ. You have my permission. You don't need to ask me. Do you know why this gentleman, Dawood Kim, David Kim, his YouTube channel exploded and went viral? Do you know why? Can I, can I share with you why? You guys want to know the answer? Hey, what's up, brother? Uh, we will. Just be patient, brother. We, we wait for the regulars to show up, and then we begin in prayer. Just be patient. I promise. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we let the Holy Spirit take over. The reason why is because you have Muslims who are fanatical about their false god and false prophet and will come in droves to support <clears throat> Muslims, especially converts, and make them go viral and explode, right, to give them a platform. That's why. Thank you, Wilderman. What we need now is our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ who love Jesus Christ and have found sound teachers and sound teaching in spite of their imperfections, in spite of my imperfection. We Christians, I'm not saying everyone who claims to be a Christian is a Christian, but still we are more in number than Muslims because when they tell you 1.7 billion Muslims, that's that's including Shia and the variations of Shia Islam, the, the you know, heretical versions of Islam, Alawi and Druze and so on. Christianity is over 2 billion, and that's including everyone, Roman Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants, and the cults. Okay. Can you imagine if Christians were to come along, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, and subscribe to their YouTube channels and like their videos? Can you imagine what would happen to, let's say, my YouTube channel or Vocab Malone's YouTube channel? Now, glory to God, the Lord Jesus has blessed David Wood. He's been working on this for over 10 years. He's built his YouTube channel slowly but surely, hard work and sacrifice and a loving, godly wife who understands that God has called him to this work and helped him and prayed for him, encouraged him, and raised up five lions, five boys for him for the glory of Jesus, and he's over 400,000. But this guy, David Kim, Dowd Kim, comes out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. What, less than a year? And he's got what, Millions? And here we are, and I'm not complaining, honestly. Just I'm just trying to put in perspective. Here I am. I can hardly get 300. Sometimes I don't even get 200. And I can hardly get people, more than 2,000 people watching these sessions. Oh, they're too long. Folks, I don't care how long they are. You'll go and watch a movie for two hours, right? And yet, when there's a session that's more than 15, 20 minutes, you automatically tune off. Why? And Alan Rule, right? Under 600. Why? Folks, in these sessions, not just me, I'm not just talking about me. We're trusting the Holy Spirit to show up. So I may have a topic, but the Holy Spirit may guide the conversation where I address other issues that people 
are looking for answers to issues that are affecting their lives. And then the Holy Spirit guides the conversations in such a way where they get answers and are blown away and amazed how real God is, how real Jesus is, and how real the Spirit is, that the Spirit sees their plight, their predicament, and is answering them to show them, I'm real and I'm with you. You know how many times that's happened? Right? You know how many times that's happened? In fact, I wonder if the brother is here. I just got this, guys, just again. His name is Kevin Twenty Perez. May the Lord Jesus shine his face on him and preserve Kevin Twenty Perez and all of you. I just got this, what, 40, uh, 59 minutes ago. Watch here. Let me read it for you guys, okay? Look what he said. You don't know how much this has helped me. This is my last session. I was struggling and doubting because some Muslims send me some proof of the Bible being changed and corrupted. I'm 47 minutes in the video, and my doubting is cured, and I feel a new love for Christ. Thank you so much. God bless you. This is why we do what we do. Did you hear that? You guys hear? This is my goal. What did I say my goal for the channel is? That the Holy Spirit will use me to strengthen the body of believers to have no doubt the Bible is the absolute perfect word of God. The God of the Bible is real. He is almighty. He is existence. He is reality. Without him, nothing would exist. And Jesus Christ is the God man. All right? So and with the hopes that the Lord will also bring others out of their darkness as well. So when you talk about David Kim Sergun, he's this Korean kid who is stupid enough to become a Muslim. And follows Allah, the satanic being, masquerading as the true God, and Muhammad, an antichrist and false prophet, a pedophile, a woman raping, woman whoring, false prophet. And it's the true, true truth. I'm perfectly describing Muhammad based on Muslim sources. And his YouTube channel has gone viral. You know why? Because Muslims flock. They come in droves. They make the most pathetic right, YouTube channels. The most pathetic Muslim polemicist apologists, the most illiterate, uneducated Muslim apologist polemicists go viral because they flock to them in droves. How I wish Christians would do that for us, for the glory of Jesus Christ. Right? Right? So with that said, let's begin ask the Father to bless this session in Jesus' name by the power of the Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. Yes, and Lord, unfortunately, to my shame, forgive me, Father. We love you imperfectly. We succumb to our flesh all too easily. Have mercy on us, Father, and save us from our flesh, our sinful passions. And please, Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, give us victory over our flesh to become more like Jesus Christ, your Son, your heart, who became flesh. We love and adore you, Son of God. Cover us by your blood. Wash us in your blood, Lord Jesus. It's by your blood that we are protected. Your blood is our shield against Satan. By your blood, we overcome him. By the blood of your cross, Lord Jesus, and seal us by your spirit. We love you, Holy Spirit. Please give us victory and give us self-control and self-restraint. And give us the grace to be self-disciplined, to engage in these spiritual disciplines by your power, to become more like Jesus, to die to our flesh and live the life that you want us to live by your power for the glory of Jesus. May Christ increase in us, Holy Spirit. Take over the session, please. Anoint my words to speak truth without, our, without error and grant everyone here illumination from your glorious presence, Holy Spirit. Save me from error, confusion, and stammering and help me not to forget these passages, to recall them and interpret them perfectly by your power and guide this conversation. Take over this con conversation, this session. And not only this session, take over our lives, Holy Spirit. Our lives are yours. It, we belong to you. You own us for the glory of Jesus. Teach us and sanctify us and perfect us and transform us and save us from our own flesh, from the influence of the world, from Satan and his children, and bless this session mightily for the glory of Jesus. You know the needs of the people. Use me, an unprofitable slave of yours, to speak to them so they can be shown and Reminded of how real and alive you are because you are life and you are with them and you hear their cries and you love them and you bring them to Jesus. Use me for that. And Holy Spirit, protect our children, protect our families, our loved ones. If we have spouses, protect them. Parents, protect them. 
Siblings, protect them. Children, grandchildren, protect them all and bring them to the feet of Jesus Christ. Especially in this madness, protect them for the glory of Jesus. And in my case, my angels, protect them and seal them for the glory of Jesus Christ. Please, Holy Spirit, take over and have your way. And give me the health I need. Fill my throat and my lungs and chest, chest with health from your glorious presence. O breath of life, eternal breath of the Father and the Son. And the holiness to delight the heart of Jesus Christ. We need you, Holy Spirit. We need you, Son of God. We need you, Father. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' almighty name, Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah Rapha. Yahovah Rapha. Yahovah Rapha. Heal. Heal us spiritually, emotionally, <clears throat> psychologically, and physically. For the glory of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah Rapha, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Guys, I'm going to do another session today by popular demand. Well, I don't know if it's popular demand, but Lord willing, tonight I'm going to do another session. And the reason why I'm going to do another session is because, unfortunately, because of the riots, we're on a curfew. We're on lockdown. Can't go anywhere. And here in my state, the curfew is at 8 p.m. And tragically, I just saw this video, tragically, tragically, tragically okay and i just posted it on my youtube channel i'm not youtube channel I'm sorry my facebook pages okay someone just recorded someone just recorded a retired police captain shot dead in st louis while trying to protect store against looters and if i recall he was 77 years old and you see him dying and his life ebbing away and you have the man recording it and shouting at the people. Over a TV set, you kill this man? Over a TV set? And so this is what I put. Heartbreaking and disgusting. A sign of the depravity and sinfulness of humanity unless and until God either constrains and or transforms our fallen wicked nature. A man retired as a police captain. And he's black. He's African American. He's black. That's the irony being killed by blacks in the name that what the policeman did to that poor George Floyd was a crime, was murder, and you kill a black man, 77, I believe, retired. If you are not convinced that the Bible is 100% absolutely true in the Word of God and what it says about man is incorrect, look around you. We humans prove the Bible is absolutely correct because it's the word of the creator who knows our condition better than us. All right? Tragic. Yep. Let me give you the link so you can watch it yourself. He's lying there dying in a pool of blood. Yes, yeah, 77-year-old man, David Dorn. And you see his life ebbing away. Killed because they were looting TV sets. Unbelievable. Here you go. Exactly, Pedro. Here you go. And you're still not convinced that the Bible is the Word of God and the Bible assesses the human condition perfectly. It tells man what he is, warts and all, and doesn't sugarcoat it like other religions, religions do. That we are depraved unless God constrains our evil hearts and or transforms them. Here you go. Here's the link. Come, Lord Jesus, sooner than later. There you go. So there you go. What are you going to do? It's life. Okay. Sorry about that. Let's begin. We're going to begin. So Lord willing, tonight, tonight, Lord willing, I'm going to do a special session. Guys, invite people for the session. Let's make this channel go viral for the glory of Christ. Lord willing, tonight at 12 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, which in Europe, it should be early in the morning. You should be awake. 12 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to do a session on, do the miracles of Jesus Christ prove his deity? Do the miracles of Jesus prove that he's God in the flesh? So I'm going to look at the miracles of Jesus, the reasons why he did the miracles, and what do these miracles tell us about Jesus Christ? So I'm going to do that topic tonight, thanks to Razzle Dazzle, who's probably asleep right now. Yep, exactly, Jake. It's going to be around 5 or 6 a.m., so get some beauty sleep, right? Because we're on curfew. We can't go anywhere. 
So there you go, guys. So let's begin. I'm going to finish. This will now be the final part in my series on Jesus Christ and angelic creatures. Jesus Christ and angelic creatures. So it's 5 a.m. UK time. Don't make excuses. You'll be up. Jesus Christ and angelic creatures, right? And invite people to come, right? Let me give you the articles that go with this session. I want to finish the series. And then Lord Jesus willing, Lord Jesus willing, I'm going to begin a series on the biblical basis for the Nicene Creed. Lord Jesus willing, I also want to talk about John 3, 5. What did our blessed Lord mean when he said, you must be born of water and spirit, which is a timely message in light of the depravity and corruption and the evil that you see around you. Magda, we're going to work on it today. I'm sorry. This precious sister keeps hounding me. Oh, well, I say hounding and respectfully. I, I, don't, I don't mean no disrespect. Like she wants to help me how to schedule my sessions in advance. And I've been delaying it, not deliberately. It's partly because I've been busy and partly because I'm lazy. Exactly, Pedro. So, Lord willing, maybe we'll do it right after the session if you're awake because I know it's late for you. Okay. Guys, save these links. Save these links. These are the links that will go with these sessions. That's one. Here's the second one. We're going to now continue to exegete chapters, chapter 1 of Hebrews. As the Lord Jesus loosens my tongue, anoints the sound of my voice to be pleasing to your ears. We're going to continue our interpretation of Hebrews 1 to show you that if you properly interpret Hebrews 1, if you properly Understand, explain, and exegete Hebrews 1. Don't forget, Amanda, tonight at 12 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, which should be 9 p.m., I'll be doing another live stream. So join us and invite people to watch. I think it should be the same time for you, my time, 9 p.m. So God willing. Anyway, if you properly inter interpret Hebrews 1, Hebrews 1, then... The jig is up. Unitarianism is a lie from the pit of hell. Joe's witnesses and those that believe like them, Arians, that theology, lie from the pit of hell. All these <clears throat> doctrines which demote Jesus and deny that he is God absolutely and eternally. Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit. And therefore, the Trinity being true. All those views that oppose this teaching are, and let me be politically incorrect, because I know in the academic world, in academia and scholarship, you have to speak very politely and kindly and speak in generalities and can't be very forceful and passionate. Baloney. Let me be politically incorrect. Decimation, if you understand how to interpret Hebrews 1 correctly, it will annihilate the lies and the blasphemies of Arians who say that Jesus is the first creature of God or Socinians and their cousins who say that Jesus is just a man. It's the truth. If you learn to properly interpret Hebrews 1, and in these series I provided the exegesis that cannot be refuted by any honest Seeker of truth. If you're honest to God and you fear God and you love truth and hate lies, you can't refute it because this is the interpretation of Hebrews 1. But unfortunately, many people love their traditions and their lies and are demonized. So it doesn't matter what the Bible says. What matters is what they can make the Bible say in support of their satanic false doctrines. So may the Lord Jesus be glorified. Okay, are we ready now? I've already covered a lot of ground. I've laid the foundation. I'm going to continue where I left off. So I'm not going to go back and discuss in depth what I've already touched upon by the power of the Holy Spirit in the four previous sessions. What I'm going to continue to do is to show you that Jesus is identified as Jehovah God, even though he's not the Father, he's not the Spirit, and that angelic creatures are commanded to worship him as Jehovah God. And therefore, Jesus cannot be an angelic creature. So let me explain what I want to accomplish right now. I'm going to show you from Hebrews 1. Jesus is identified as Jehovah. 
Yod He Vav He. Yahovah. You know, however you want to pronounce the name. People pronounce it Yahweh, Jehovah, Jehovah, Yahovah. Hebrews identifies Jesus as Jehovah who became flesh, who is distinct from the Father, as well as the Holy Spirit, and yet one with them in essence, and therefore cannot be an angelic creature. So let's get ready to go into the meat. I gave you the links to the articles. So let's unpack it for the glory of Jesus Christ. And then also show you why the New World Translation's rendering of Hebrews 1.8 is not correct. It's invalid contextually. <clears throat> and you'll see what I mean in a minute. As Holy Spirit will take over, I pray for the glory of Jesus and bless you and understand what I'm saying and I don't confuse you. Let's go to Hebrews 1 verse 6. Hebrews 1 continues to show why Jesus Christ is infinitely superior and better to angelic creatures. That Jesus Christ, though he's a man, truly human, by virtue of also being God who became man, he's infinitely superior and better to angelic creatures. Now, here is where we're going to have fun. Hebrews 1 verse 6. Let's pay attention. Trust the internet connection to stay strong. Hold on. By the way, uh, you'll probably see. You guys see here? You see that? You see that Band-Aid? Ask me what happened to me later. So I need a little love and attention, right, because I feel lonely. But ask me what happened. Why do I have a Band-Aid on my head? But let's focus on Hebrews 1, verse 6. Okay. But when he again brings his firstborn into the heaven and earth, he says, and let all of God's angels do obeisance to him. This is why Protestant believer is one of the greatest mysteries known to mankind. You know why? He never fails to shock me in that I don't know what translation he's going to quote. For some reason, he quotes the New World Translation of Hebrews 1, verse 6, even though I didn't ask him to, because in Hebrews 1, verse 6, they don't translate the Greek word proskuneo's worship in order to rob Jesus of the worship he, des he, he deserves by virtue of being God. I mean, I'm never left in... A, in in awe and shock when Protestants are around. There's not a day he doesn't shock me. All right? Okay, let's let's try this again. Hebrews 1, verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Okay, did you catch what it says? It says, when God will bring the Son into the inhabited earth, now, there's a debate. Is this referring to when the sun came in to the earth or at the second coming? What does it mean? That's irrelevant. It's irrelevant if it's referring to the second coming or it's referring to when Jesus entered into this world and did what the Father sent him to do. And in response to the son perfectly accomplishing the Father's will, the Father honors the son, exalts the son, magnifies the sun and glorifies the sun and demands that all the angels do likewise. Okay? So is this referring to when he first came into the world or is it referring to the second coming? That is irrelevant. Okay, understand, I'm trying and trusting the Spirit to save me from error. It's irrelevant whether it's referring to Jesus entering the world to perfectly accomplish the Father's will and then the Father responding to what the Son did and humbling himself to bring about the redemption of God's people by then exalting and glorifying him and demanding the angels to worship him? Or is this referring to Christ at his second coming where the entire earth will be then subject to all redeemed believers? Every human being who's trusted in Jesus, redeemed by Jesus, sealed by the Spirit, and transformed by Jesus to share in his rule in the world to come, a world in which angels will no longer rule over human beings, but be subject to the spiritual body of Christ, the redeemed in Jesus, redeemed believers in Jesus, who will have the angels subject to them and serving them because of what Jesus did for them. Are you with me there? What is it referring to? Either way, it's irrelevant. What I want you to focus on, are you focusing? Either way, it's irrelevant. Is it referring to the future? 
where the world to come will be subject to human beings who are united to Jesus because what Jesus did for us, and therefore angels will be subservient to us in the world to come and won't share in the rule of Christ that we will share in because Jesus has purchased us and made us one with him spiritually to be a spiritual body, his bride, kings and queens, sharing in his reign over creation? Or is it referring to what Jesus did in the first coming in bringing about God's plan of redemption and the Father responding to the Son's condescension and willful humbling himself to take a status lower than the angels and exalting him now to his rightful place and demanding the angels to acknowledge his Son for who he is and what he's done? So I'm repeating myself more than once. And the reason why I repeat myself more than once is because I know we're creatures of repetition. And we have to hear something repetitively until it becomes second nature and we can understand it. And then we can preach it for the glory of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. So whatever interpretation, either interpretation leads to the same conclusion. Either interpretation leads to the same conclusion. And what's the conclusion? The Father demands all the angels to worship his firstborn. Let's look at it again. Hebrews 1 verse 6. Either interpretation results in the same conclusion. God demands all my angels worship my firstborn. Folks, can I ask you a question? Let's unpack this. Are you ready for some meat? Because I like meat. Even I'm trying to lose weight. I like meat. Are you guys ready for some meat? Okay. You know what that means? That means that Jesus is not an angelic creature. Otherwise, Jesus will be worshiping himself. It's because Did you catch what the text says? Let all the angels of God worship him. Not some, not most, but every one of them. So if Jesus is an angelic creature, is he going to worship himself? Did you catch the phrasing? Ironically, you can find this. Sheikh Google, Google this. I don't have the quotes in front of me. Did you know that the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society at one time argued on the basis of Hebrews 1.6, that Jesus could not be the archangel Michael because of Hebrews 1.6, but then they changed their position. Again, I'm going by memory. Hopefully, Lord, please forgive me. Protect me if I'm mistaken. Can someone check that out? Can you Google and say Hebrews 1.6, Joe's witnesses prove Jesus is an archangel Michael? Yep. I'm going by memory. I hope I'm not wrong. I don't want to be mistaken, but I, I highly doubt I'm mistaken. Okay. Okay, so someone can check it out on Google. You can do that. Hebrews 1 6, used by Joe's witnesses to prove Jesus isn't Michael. Right? So, what's the point? The point is, how can Christ be an angelic creature when all angelic beings are commanded to worship him? Let's look at it, Hebrews 1 6 again. One more time. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Now, let me tie other passages with this. So you understand the logic, right? Focus so you can learn the arguments and how to interpret Hebrews correctly for the glory of Jesus Christ. It says all the angels of God. Anyone exempted? Anyone excluded? If all the angels of God worship him, then the angels of God form one group in distinction from the Son. So the sun is not one of them. They are not like the sun. The sun is distinct and differentiated from all the angels. So then how can he be a created angelic being? You with me there? But it's going to get a little better. It's going to get a little better. And this time we are going to use the Jehovah's Witness Bible. This time, yes, Kevin, God bless you, brother. I just mentioned you. May the Lord strengthen you. May you learn. And grow in your love for Jesus. And may you be sealed in every one of us for the glory of Christ. This time we're going to use the Joe Witness Bible. Because I'm going to show you. I want you to see by the grace of God. How the Bible utterly decimates these false satanic doctrines from the pit of hell. 
and shout that the Trinity is God and Jesus is the God man. Philippians 2, verses 9 to 11 in the Jehovah Witness Bible. No, they, they translate it slightly differently. Yeah, I just was told that Matt Slick said something to me on his live stream to criticize me. That's fine. Philippians 2, verses 9 to 11. For this very reason, God exalted him to a superior position and kindly gave him the name that is above every other name. Pay attention, folks. Notice they inserted the word other here. I'm going to get back to that in a minute. Folks, this is the Jehovah Witness Bible. What I want you to see is that how they inserted other. I call this other situs. They insert words that are not in the Greek and are not demanded by the Greek syntax and grammar. Notice it says that he is given the name above every other name. Every other name. And I'm going to show you from their own Greek that the word other is not there. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, every other name. So that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bend. Now, here's what I want you to catch. Every knee should bend. Where? Of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the ground. And every tongue should openly acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Folks, can I ask you a question? I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, as I've said. If Paul exhausts the language to refer to every creature, because he says every knee will bend in heaven, on earth, beneath the ground. That's all of creation, right? Is that all of creation? Heaven is created, and the things in heaven are created. On earth, in the ground, earth is created, and everything in the earth is created. So if it says every knee bends in heaven, earth, and the ground, that's all creation. Every creature will bend. So then how can every creature bend to Jesus if Jesus is a creature why is he excluded from every created thing? And why is he the object of devotion and worship by every created thing? I thought he too was a creature. You see how Philippians 2 verses 9 11 shows Jesus is not a creature, though he took on a human nature and a physical body that's created. Pay attention. The human nature that he took and the physical body that he took from his blessed mother while she was a virgin, that is created. He, as a person, is eternal and uncreated. So I want to know, Jehovah's Witnesses and Arians, how can every created thing be distinguished from Christ, separated from Christ, if Christ is a creature? Wouldn't he be included in that category of every tongue and every knee? Why is he distinguished from them? You with me there? Oh, but it gets a little worse for them. Remember, this is the Jehovah Witness Bible. This is the Jehovah Witness Bible. Now, let's go to Revelation 5.13 in the Jehovah Witness Bible. Revelation 5, verse 13. Jehovah Witness Bible. This is the Jehovah's Witness Bible, folks. And I heard every creature, again, in case you don't get the point, he exhausts the language like Paul did by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and underneath the earth and on the sea and all things in them. That's all creation, folks. Heaven, earth, beneath the earth, on the sea. And all things in the heavens and earth, that's all of creation. No creature is excluded. Not even John, who would be seeing himself in that group, because this is talking about the glory and the worship that the Son will receive and shall receive from, from every creature eventually and inevitably. Like Philippians 2 verses 9 11. And I'll show you when that takes place. Now, every creature in heaven, on earth, underneath the earth, and on the sea, and all things in them, saying, To the one sitting on the throne, and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor, and the glory, and the might, forever and ever. Wow. So every creature in the entire creation is giving the Lamb, Jesus, the same exact worship 
that God the Father Almighty receives and for the same duration of time, forever and ever. You want me there? You want me there? Watch the tap dance, the deliberate perversion and distorting of these passages. Because once they've made up their mind, they're demonized and used of the devil. They cannot let Jesus be who he is, and the Bible speak with the clarity that it does. So every creature is on one side. Now notice where the Lamb is. He's not part of creation, worshiping the Father. He is separate and distinguished from every created thing in the entire creation, on the same side that the Father is, and he's receiving the same worship from every created thing in all creation that the Father receives forever and ever. Right? Of course, Alex, they always have a way of getting around it. That's the point. Once you've made up your mind and you're under the influence of Satan and cannot let God be who he is and the Bible say what it says, of course you're going to explain it away, Alex. That's a given. That's why it has to be the Holy Spirit of the living God to illuminate them and enable them and set them free to accept the Bible for what it says and accept God for who he is. That's the work of God. That's the work of grace. That's the work of the Father, the Son, and union with the Holy Spirit. So don't think that's going to make them believers. Alex, if you think showing them this passage is going to make them change, friend, you are deceiving yourself. And I know you mean it with, with love and kindness because you want to see them get saved. What you do is you present these passages Refute their objections and trust the Holy Spirit for the results. Right? So you see how Hebrews 1.6 says, Jesus cannot be an angelic creature. All angels worship him. That's number one. And you see how Philippians 2 verses 9 to 11 and Revelation 5.13 in the Jehovah's Witness Bible teaches, states clearly, every creature in the entire creation Worships Jesus in union with God the Father. How can then Jesus be a mere creature when he's distinguished from every created thing in the entire creation and he's receiving the same worship that the Father receives forever and ever? So far, are you with me? Because I have a lot of unpacking in Hebrews 1 verse 6. A lot to unpack in Hebrews 1 6. Right. Let's go back and look at Philippians 2, verses 9 to 11 one more time. Philippians 2, verses 9 to 11. Haters, I'm doing a live stream, so send your 900 board viewers to watch me. And stop distracting. Okay, Philippians 2, verses 9 to 11. For this very reason, God exalted him to a superior position and kindly kindly gave him the name that is above every other name. Now pay attention to verses 10 to 11. Pay attention to the language, saints, because I'm going to show you where Paul is getting this language from. Where is Paul taking this language from? Pay attention. So that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bend of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the ground. That's all creation. That's entire creation. Nothing is exempt. And every tongue should openly acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Notice every knee bends and every tongue confesses. Do you know where Paul took this from? Paul took an Old Testament passage about the worship that every human being must give to Jehovah and applied it to Jesus. Isaiah 45 verse 23 in the Jehovah Witness Bible. Isaiah 45 verse 23 in the Jehovah Witness Bible. Watch here, folks. Watch what happens. By myself I have sworn, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and, I, and it will not return. To me every knee will bend. Every tongue will swear loyalty. Wait, wait, wait. Isaiah says, Jehovah has sworn, and it will come to pass. Every knee will bend to Jehovah, and every tongue will swear loyalty to him. Paul says that's fulfilled 
when every creature bows to Jesus and confesses with their tongue, he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So wait, Paul. This was said of Jehovah. Here you're saying it will be said about Jesus to the glory of God the Father, in union with God the Father. So are you now saying that the Jehovah whom every knee will bow to and every tongue will swear loyalty to is the Father and Jesus together? Together? God bless you. God bless you, Rebecca. You caught it, guys? Do you guys see? What is said of Jehovah is applied to the Father and Son, the Son in union with the Father. Now, when will this happen? When will this happen where every cre creature, every knee, every tongue, will willfully or un... How do I say? Not so much unwillfully, but by compulsion. Willfully or by compulsion, bow in worship of the Father and the Son in recognition that they are the God of all flesh. Romans 14, verses 9 to 12. It tells you when this is going to take place. Yep. Romans 14, verses 9 to 12. I'm going to show you something that the Jehovah's Witnesses did in their translation. Okay. For to this end Christ died and came to life again, so that he might be Lord over both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you also look down on your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Pay attention. Whose judgment seat? God. Guys, pay attention to 10. We will stand, even believers, Christians will stand before the judgment seat of God to give an account to God. So now notice, this is when Isaiah 40, 45, 23 will be fulfilled. That's when it will be fulfilled on the day of judgment. Notice, 11. For it is written, as surely as I live, says Jehovah, to me every knee will bend and every tongue will make open acknowledgement to God. So then each of us will render an account for himself to God. Did you catch it? When will Isaiah 45, 23 be fulfilled? At the last day, at the day of judgment, where every creature in existence will bow before God on the throne at the last day, at the day of judgment. So what John is seeing in Revelation is an eschatological event, an event that will be fulfilled at the last day, at the day of judgment, as a present reality. He's seeing what will take place where every creature, willfully or by compulsion, even those whom Christ says, vanquished and subjugated, confess and worship the Father and Son as the one God of all creation, of all flesh. Of course, even Satan. Who's excluded, Dominus? Come on. Every knee will bend in heaven, on earth and the ground. I heard every creature saying, in heaven, on earth, beneath the earth and the seas and all things in them. No one is excluded. This is why I said, either willfully or by compulsion. So when Satan does it, it's not he's doing it willfully. He's doing it because he has no choice. He's been vanquished and subjugated, and now he's compelled to acknowledge the Father and the Son. Making sense? It's like when you attack a city and you take its inhabitants captive and you take the king or the ruler of that area captive and then you bring them in chains and you, you, you force them to bow before your feet as a sign they've been subjugated and vanquished by you. You with me there? So when will this take place? When will this take place, folks? Sorry I'm that loud. I don't mean to be loud, but just for some reason I'm an angry person. When will this take place? Judgment Day, right? Okay. Now, let's look at Romans 14, verse 10. One more time. Romans 14, verse 10, the Jehovah Witness Bible. Romans 14, verse 10. But why do you judge your brother, or why do you also look down on your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, right? 
Judgment seat of God, correct? Okay. Now compare it. The same Paul who wrote Romans 14, verse 10, also wrote 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. Now let's see what 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 states. Now I hope Last Supper Apologetics, you're joking and you're not blaspheming. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. Watch here. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, I'm confused. Whose judgment seat is it? Before whose judgment seat will we stand, believers and unbelievers alike, and give an account, so that each one may be repaid according to the things he has practiced while in the body, whether good or bad? Whose judgment seat? Second Corinthians 5 verse 10 says, the judgment seat of Christ. But in Romans 14, 10, it says the judgment seat of God. You guys ain't paying attention. Romans 14, 10, Paul says the judgment seat of God, and we're going to give an account to him. St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 10, the judgment seat of Christ. This is the New World Translation. That's how their version reads. So is it God or Christ? Both and. God and Christ, because Christ is God, though he's not the Father or the Holy Spirit. You see, you see what's happening here? Okay. You want me there? Everyone getting it from the Jehovah Witness Bible? So now let me show you something they did with Philippians 2.9, so we can go back to Hebrews 1.6. All of this is related to my interpretation, exegesis, of Hebrews 1 6, which is a nightmare for the heretics who blaspheme the triumph God and try to rob Jesus of his glory to their shame and destruction and humiliation, unless and until they repent by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's go to Philippians 2 9 one more time, the Jehovah Witness Bible. I'm going to teach you how to use their own sources, their own literature, to refute them and glorify the triumph God. They have an online website, jw.org jw.org all their literature and their bible versions and their even even their greek interlinear is online for free use it use it because here i want to show you something i'm going to show you the very greek text that they publish and they use for their translation i'm going to get it to you let me get it for you real quickly okay online bible here it is here's the link Philippians 2.9, it says, For this very reason, God exalted him to a superior position and kindly gave him the name that is above every other name. Other, right? They insert the word other. Click there for their Bibles that they make available online for free. There you're going to see the kingdom interlinear translation of the Greek scriptures. Here's the link. The kingdom interlinear translation of the Greek scriptures. Here's their link. Okay. Click on it. Follow with me. God has blessed you with so much resources for free to use to glorify him, to know him, to fall in love with him, to trust in him and have no doubt he is God and the Bible is his word. And be mighty in the spirit to magnify the name of Jesus Christ and preach his gospel until every knee bends and every tongue confesses Jesus is Yehovah to the glory of God the Father. Here is their interlinear Greek of Philippians 2. Here it is. Okay. Here it is. Here you go. Click on it. Folks, read their own interlinear. Their own interlinear. Okay. There you're going to see they give you the Greek. And then the English words that correspond to each Greek word. Look at it. Can you show me where the word other is? It's not there. Notice their own Greek. Through which also the God, him put high above over, and he graciously gave to him the name, the over every name. Huper pan onoma or onoma. Huper tu huper. Pan anoma, anoma. Where's the word other? Where's the word other? This is their own interlinear translation of the Greek scriptures. They're giving you evidence to expose them. How they pervert the scriptures to their shame and destruction. 
Do you see it? Where's the word other? Folks, do you know why they inserted the word other? Can I tell you why they inserted the word other? Exactly, Ron. Do you know why they inserted the word other? Can anyone take a guess? Because if they admit God exalted Jesus to the highest position and gave him the name that's above all names, he must be Jehovah. Because Jehovah's name alone is exalted above every name. Go to Psalm 148, 13 in their own translation. Psalm 148, 13 in their own translation. Of course they think he's a creature. They don't think he's God Almighty in the flesh. Here. That's why they inserted the word other, because they don't want you to see that Jesus has been exalted to the status and position and worship and glory of Jehovah. Because notice, Psalm 148, 13. Let them praise the name of Jehovah, for his name alone, only his name is unreachably high. His majesty is above earth and heaven. Do you guys catch it? Now, guys, think with me. If Jehovah's name alone is unreachably high, only his name, and Jesus has been given the name above every name, what name, what position, what rank, what status does Jesus have? Let me repeat it again one more time. If Jehovah's name alone is unreachably high, and then Philippians 2.9 says, Jesus is given the name above every name. So what status, what position, what glory, what worship does Jesus now possess? What's the word? What name? Give me what's in the text. Let me repeat it again. If Jehovah's, it is three times, guys. If Jehovah's name, Jehovah, his name alone is unreachably high, and Jesus is given the name above every name, what status, what position, what glory, what worship does Jesus possess? Jehovah, you got it. But how could the Father bestow on Jesus the status, the position, the worship, the glory belonging to Jehovah alone if he's a creature and he's not Jehovah. No, not Jehovah, same father, Rebecca. Please, don't make the mistake of thinking only the father's Jehovah. No, you're wrong. You got it, Candace. Do you get it now? You understand why then later on in verses 2 and 11, 10, 11, Philippians 2, 10 to 11, Paul could then say, at the name of Jesus, every knee would bend in heaven, on earth, and beneath the ground, and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. A worship that is found in Isaiah 45, 23, where Jehovah says, every knee will bow to me and swear loyalty to me. He took that worship, which Jehovah demands of all humans, and ascribed it to Jesus. Why could he take the worship? That Jehovah receives and says, Jesus will receive it because he just told you. Jesus has been exalted to the status, position, sovereignty, authority, worship, and glory that belongs to Jehovah. Why? Because he must be Jehovah. Otherwise, the Father has exalted a creature to the status that belongs to the creator. And he's now ascribing the worship belonging to the creator to a creature, thereby idolatry. Right? You with me there? So now you see why the Joe's Witnesses inserted the word other? Now let me refute a, a potential objection. Because these heretics will do everything to rob Jesus of his glory and blaspheme his name. Yep, Philo puts me in a pickle. Now, let me tell you how they're going to respond to Philippians 2. Exactly, Candace. Basically, everything said about Jehovah is ascribed to Jesus in the New Testament. 
Now, you know what they're going to tell you? No, oh, wait, 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 wait. It says God exalted him and gave him that name. Why would Jesus be given the name Jehovah if he's already Jehovah by nature? And they think that's a good objection. Are you ready for me to respond to it? How could he be given the name of Jehovah if he's already Jehovah by nature? Because the context is talking about status and position. When it says God has highly exalted him and given him the name, remember how the word name functions in the Bible. You got to get this point. If you don't get this point, you won't understand anything then. The Bible uses the term name to refer to the characteristics, nature, and or authority of a thing. So when you speak of name, sometimes the word name is being used in reference to the authority of a person, the position of a person, the status of a person, right? Well, it's like to use a very bad analogy, a modern example. If I say stop in the name of the law, in the name of the law, Meaning the authority that the law has invested in me to tell you what you do and what you don't do, right? I'm giving you a modern analogy. It's bad, but you get the point, right? Stop in the name of the law. What do I mean? Stop by the authority invested in me by the law to command you to do what I say. So when it says God gave him the name, that's simply the biblical way of saying God gave him the authority and status of Jehovah. So why did God give Jesus the status of Jehovah, the authority of Jehovah? Number one, because he is Jehovah, and that belongs to him by right. But number two, he had humbled himself on earth to take the position and status of a slave. So what it's saying is he exchanged the status of a slave for the status of Jehovah God, a status that belongs to him by right, but which he voluntarily set aside to become a slave on earth. You understand the point? Here, let me prove it to you. Philippians 2, 6 to 9. Philippians 2, 6 to 9. If you understand biblical language, the anti-Trinitarians do not have a single argument against the Trinity. All their arguments can be demolished easily by the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the Bible, which is Trinitarian. Here, let me prove it to you. Philippians 2, 6 to 9. Who, although, this is referring to Jesus, who, although he was existing in God's form, gave no consideration to a seizure, namely that he should be equal to God. No, but he emptied himself, how? And took a slave's form. He emptied himself of that equality, that position of equality, by taking the position of a slave a slain form and became human more than that when he came as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death yes death on a torture state talk about butchering the greek but anyway for this reason very reason because jesus humbled himself and set aside his position of equality to take the status and position of a slave on earth when he became man for this reason god then responds to what jesus did by exalting him and giving him the name, meaning the status that belongs to Jehovah, because that is his status by right, but which he set aside voluntarily. Making sense? You see, if you understand the Trinity, and you understand the biblical basis for the Trinity, you understand the Trinity is irrefutable? Biblically, it's irrefutable because the Trinity is a fact of biblical revelation. And the God who exists is triune, Father, Son, and Spirit. But that's if you understand what the Trinity teaches, what the Bible teaches about Jesus having two natures, God and man, and understand how to interpret biblical language. Clear everyone with me so far?
I just want to let it sink in before I move on. Is there anyone confused? So if someone tells you, why would God give Jesus the name Jehovah if he's already Jehovah by nature? Because read the context. He humbled himself to take the position and status of a slave on earth when he became human. So he set aside his status, his glory, his honor, his position as Jehovah to take the status of a slave. So then God then exalts him to the status of Jehovah, a status that's his by right, but which he voluntarily set aside. And then that explains why, folks, in Philippians 2, 10 to 11, the worship that Jehovah says every human must give to him, is Isaiah 45, 23, is the very worship what Paul says every creature in creation will give to Jesus. Paul, how can you say the worship that every human creature must give to Jehovah? And Isaiah 45, 23, will be given to Jesus, not just by human creatures, every creature in all creation. Because he said every knee will bend in heaven, on earth, beneath the ground. That's all creation, Paul. How can every created thing give to Jesus the worship that Isaiah says belongs to Jehovah alone? And how can every creature worship Jesus if Jesus is a creature? Wouldn't he be part of creation, worshiping the Father? Why is he distinguished from every creature? And the answer is simple, because he's not a creature. He's Jehovah God who became flesh. I know you're joking, truth seeker. I know you're joking, right? Did that point sink in? Because it's going to get better. Hebrews 1 verse 6. It's going to get better. Hebrews 1 6. It's going to get better, my friend. Let's go back to Hebrews 1 6. <laughs> no matter what you do, I'm going crazy. I'd rather be alone. Okay. Not the New World Translation, though. Notice they mistranslate the Greek here, obeisance. Let's go back to the King James, because I'm going to show you something. Bulis, bulis, brother, bulis. Hebrews 1, verse 6. Watch here. It's going to get better. We were sailing along, Mulai Bay. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Folks. Hebrews 1 is quoting an Old Testament passage. Hebrews 1, verse 6, is quoting an Old Testament passage. Can anyone tell me what Old Testament passage he's quoting? And he's not quoting the Hebrew. He's quoting the Greek version of the Old Testament. He's quoting the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Can anyone guess where he's going? Can anyone tell me? I'm going to let the New World Translation tell you. You ready? Here, let me get you the links. Bear with me. It's in my article. It's in, this, in both articles, especially this one. Let me give you the link again. Okay. It's in this article, but I'm going to give you their own resources. Okay. Let's go to their site. That's why I'm saying use their resources to your advantage for the glory of Jesus. Here. I'm going to click on the 1984 New World Translation Edition. Here it goes. Okay. Guys, I hope you're enjoying this, that you feel like you're getting meat and you're seeing the depth and beauty of Scripture and falling more in love with the Trinity and seeing more irrefutable proof that Jesus is God Almighty. The Holy Spirit, Gianna, blessed me and anointed me and empowered me to learn this stuff. Okay, there is the link. There is the link. Now, we're going to go to Hebrews 1, verse 6. Hebrews 1, verse 6, in their translation. Let me get you the link. We were sailing along. Okay, let me click on 6. Okay. Here it is. We're going to look at both versions. Okay, click there. Now, when you go there, you're going to see at the end a cross sign, a plus sign. 
You click on the plus sign, and it tells you, this is quoting Deuteronomy 32.43. Guys, can you confirm it for yourselves? Don't take my word for it. No, not Psalm 97.7. If you go there, Dominus, I'm not saying Psalm 97.7 is not a possibility. I'm saying what they tell you. If you click there, please, you'll see a plus sign, a cross sign. Click on it. What cross reference do they give you? That's why it's a sign of a cross. Sign of a cross means cross reference. That this is quoting the following. You guys see it? Deuteronomy 32, 43. Now, here is where it gets a little tricky, folks. Now, here's where I need you to pay attention. As I said yesterday, God in his beauty and majesty, providentially, in his divine providence, provision, worked in such a way where his people copied and recopied the Bible in various languages and disseminated his word all over the then known world. Let me, let me take a moment to explain. Okay. God made sure that no one individual or group would have access to all the Bible manuscripts so they couldn't change them the way they wanted to and give us, give us a corrupt transmission, a corrupt line of transmission. From the moment Christians came to believe in Jesus, they started copying the Old Testament books. And from the moment the books of the New Testament were penned, they started making copies of them, and they were spread all over the then known world. And in various languages, in Aramaic, in Latin, what else? What other languages? Slips my Sahida Coptic. And because of the proliferation, the widespread copying, and in different languages of the Bible, the biblical books all over the world, this made it humanly impossible to corrupt the original wording of the original books in such a way that we don't have access to them anymore. You see what God did? And it's not an exaggeration. We have over 25,000 copies of the various books of the Bible in the various languages, the majority of which are in Latin, about 10,000, if not more. So this is how God ensured his word was preserved. Now, as I said in, I believe it was yesterday's session or the day before. Yeah, I think it was yesterday's session. As I said, a lot of times when they translated the Bible in various languages, the translators didn't simply translate literally. They gave you a commentary, and at times they would paraphrase or explain what they had. So follow with me. So if the Hebrew said something, when they translate in Greek, they wouldn't translate it literally, but translate the meaning of the Hebrew for another language, for another audience that may not understand the nuances of the Hebrew language. Everyone getting it? Before I move on to the next point. Yeah, I'm going to have to do a part six. Definitely I got to do a part six. Okay. Another point to remember. Sometimes copyists would skip over a line or a word or a sentence because remember, before the printing press, things were hand copied and they didn't have computers or typewriters or even light bulbs. These were men who did their best to copy the Bible as accurately as possible, sometimes in the very worst of conditions. So just like you and I, if we're in our 40s, you remember when you were younger in school, when you would write things with pencil or pen? How at times when you copy something from the chalkboard, sometimes your eye skipped over a line so that you missed writing a line? You with me there? Your teacher writes something, and as you're copying it, Sometimes your eye would skip over the next line. It would jump to the line after that. So when you're reading it, hey, man, I missed that line. Or sometimes you'd write the same line twice, right? That's what happened with the copying of the Bible. And that's what happened with every book hand copied prior to the printing press. It's not just through the Bible books. It's true of any and every book, even the Quran, prior to the printing press. Now, why am I saying that? Because there are times in which 
a copy doesn't have a specific word or sentence that other copies have. Okay, let me let me repeat the point. Some copies do not have certain verses, certain words, certain senten sentences that other copies have. Now, why? Well, one of the reasons is that most likely that copy that didn't have that sentence, when the copyist was copying what was in front of him, he may have skipped over that word, that line, that sentence. So there are various reasons. So am I clear? I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to help me to be as clear as possible so that I don't confuse you, but that you get educated on the transmission of the Bible books and how we know God has preserved them. Everyone getting it? Now, why am I mentioning this? Because in Deuteronomy 32, 43, you do have a variant reading. The later Hebrew copies of Deuteronomy 32, 43 read differently from the Greek version of Deuteronomy 32, 43, a reading that's now confirmed by the Dead Sea Scrolls. In 1947, we found copies of the Old Testament books written in Hebrew, written from 200 to 100 years before the birth of Jesus. We found a copy of Deuteronomy in Hebrew. And we found Deuteronomy 32, 43, having that reading that the Greek version has that the later Hebrew copies omitted. Come back later tonight, CP, if you can. Don't forget. Are you with me there? Let me repeat it again. The copy of Deuteronomy found in the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. This copy is about 200 years before Christ, written in Hebrew. In Deuteronomy 32, 43, it contains the reading found in the Greek versions that the later Hebrew copies omit and do not have. Okay, let me explain what I mean. Protestant believer, do me a favor, quote the King James, Deuteronomy 32, 43. As you do that, I got to step away for a moment. So keep yourselves entertained, all right? Just give me one second. King James, Deuteronomy 32, 43. No matter what you do, I'm going crazy. I'd rather be alone. I love you and I hate you all. La, 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 la. We will say the Lord. I will work it. Figaro, 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 only if a sister who loves Jesus, who's beautiful, thought the same and would want me to sing sing to her for the rest of her life. Okay. Deuteronomy 32, 43. No matter what you do, be glad, you nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants, and he will pay back vengeance to his adversaries and will indeed make atonement for the ground of his people. Okay. One more time. Post it. Post it one more time. I knew I had to take time to unpack this. Okay. Okay. Be glad, you nations, with his people, for he'll avenge the blood of his servants, and he'll pay back vengeance to his adversaries, and will indeed make, make, see, uh, atonement for the ground of his people. Protestant, you know you're playing mind games again, right? The last part of the sentence appeared before the first part. So this is where you threw me off. It's okay. It's not your fault, brother. It's YouTube. YouTube is acting up. Okay? So you're throwing me off. You're playing games with me. You want me to suffer Alzheimer's so I can join you in the same hospital bed. Okay, now, with that said, focus. You saw how the King James read, right? You saw how the King James read, right? Everyone read the King James? Read it again, folks. You saw how it reads, right? Please, guys, pay attention. Don't be distracted. This is the time. I don't need you to be distracted. I need you to focus. Okay. Now, let's see if you catch the difference. Quote for us the new revised standard version. The new revised standard version. Let's see if you catch the difference. 
the new revised standard version. Okay. That's okay. It's not my bad. It's your bad. Rejoice, all you nations, with his people, for he'll avenge the blood of his servants and will revenge vengeance to his adversaries. Okay, let's try this again. Which part of the new revised standard version wasn't clear? The new or the revised? I don't pay him anything, and he thinks he can get away with torturing me. The new revised standard version. That's okay. Whatever you post it, New World Translation, Alzheimer's kicking in. You're too old, buddy. You need to go to a senile home. New revised standard version. New revised standard version, folks. Hold on. Let's see if he's going to get to it. Yep, exactly. Pay attention. Let's see if you guys caught the difference. Praise, O heavens, his people. Worship him, all you gods. For he'll avenge the blood of his children and take vengeance on his adversaries. He'll repay those who hate him and cleanse the land for his people. I don't think you got it, right? New Revised Standard Version. Did you see the difference? Who caught the difference? Praise, O heavens, his people. Worship him, all you gods. Worship him, all you gods. For he'll avenge the blood of his children and take vengeance on his advers adversaries. He repay those who hate him and cleanse the land for his people. You see what the King James and the Jehovah Witness Bible did not have because they're based on the later Hebrew manuscripts. But the New Revised Standard Version took into consideration the readings of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Who caught the difference? I don't know if anyone caught it because I don't see any. What was the difference? What did this particular version of Deuteronomy have that the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses and the King James Version based on later Hebrew manuscripts did not have. You gods, but not only you gods. What exactly about those gods? No, not only gods versus nations. What exactly about those gods? You guys didn't catch it. What exactly about those gods? Worship him all you gods. Worship him, all you gods. That reading is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is the oldest extent copy of Deuteronomy, a copy written before Christ, and it's found in the Greek versions. And I'll show you what the Greek versions say. Let's compare the English Standard Version. English Standard Version. It's okay, Panus. In about five hours, I'm going to do another live stream. So 12 a.m., so that's, yeah, five hours. Four hours. So that's 8 a.m. for you, Panos. Come back. All right. Here's the English Standard Version. English Standard Version. Rejoice with him, O heavens. Bow down to him, all gods. Bow down to him, all gods. For he avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversaries. He repays those who hate him and cleanses his people's lands. Do you see the difference? The English Standard Version, the New Revised Standard Version, are taking into consideration the reading found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The copy of Deuteronomy found in 1947 among the Dead Sea Scrolls is our oldest extent copy of Deuteronomy in Hebrew written before Christ. And it has that extra phrase, worship him, all you gods. No, the Jehovah's Witnesses didn't take anything out, Candace. You're not getting it. I'm going to try it again, Candace, because you guys are not getting it. The Dead Sea Scrolls has the phrase what says, Worship him, all you gods. All you gods, worship him. The New World Translation, Jehovah's Witnesses, and the King James Version are translating Deuteronomy from later Hebrew manuscripts written after the time of Christ, that do not contain that clause. So they didn't omit anything. They were going with Hebrew manuscripts that in Deuteronomy 32.43 did not have the clause, worship him, all you gods. All you gods, worship him. Everyone with me so far?
Okay. So why does the new revised standard version and English standard version have that clause? Because they are taking into consideration recent discoveries, such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, where they found the oldest copy of Deuteronomy in Hebrew, written before Christ, older than the other Hebrew copies of Deuteronomy. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls copy of Deuteronomy, that clause is there. And it's supported by the Greek versions, because when the Greek versions were produced, they were translating a Hebrew text into Greek, and their Hebrew text had that clause, which is why it's found in the Greek versions. Everyone clear? Or did I confuse you? If someone's confused, let me know, because I will repeat it, because I want you to get this. Okay, so what do we have? The Greek versions of the Hebrew Old Testament, when they translate into Greek, their copies that they translate into Greek had the clause, worship him all you gods. That's why you'll find it in the Greek versions of the Old Testament. The later Hebrew copies of Deuteronomy produced after Christ don't have that clause. So in 1947... When we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, copies of the Old Testament books in Hebrew, one copy was Deuteronomy, written before Christ, around 200, 200 years before Christ. And when they looked at that copy, that clause was there in that Hebrew, showing that this reading, worship him, all you gods, is an ancient reading that was found in the copies of Deuteronomy even before the time of Christ. Not all of them were written around 300 BC. I know. And don't use BCE, Dominus tells him. Why are you using BCE? Are you a Christian, Dominus? Are you a Trinitarian? Are you a Trinitarian? Dominus, are you a Trinitarian? No, they don't match perfectly word for word, Panos. In a lot of places, the Dead Sea Scrolls agrees with the Greek versions, and some places it doesn't. That's the beauty of multiple copies and versions. All the readings are there. Nothing is lost, and we sift through them and learn and benefit. Dominus, don't make me ask you the question again, brother. Are you a Trinitarian? If you delay in responding, you're going to offend me. Okay, let me check it again. Okay, yes. Dominus, why would you, as a Trinitarian who worship Jesus, say BCE? When that's the anti-Christian world's attempt of robbing Jesus of his glory. BCE means before common era. They no longer want to say before Christ and AD in the year of our Lord. Because they hate our Jesus and want to rob him from our calendar. So why are you promoting that? Why BCE? B.C. means before common era and C.E. common era. They don't want to use B.C. or A.D. anymore. B.C. means before Christ and A.D. means Anno Domini in the year of our Lord, meaning the year our Lord was born. They're getting rid of B.C. and A.D. because they want to get rid of Jesus. So don't ever use B.C. and A.D. because you are then agreeing to rob Jesus of his glory and keep him out of our calendar. In fact, when you say 2000 AD, that's 2000 years from the birth of our Lord. But now when you say 2000 CE, common era, what was so common about that era? What makes it the common era? Why is it the common era? What happened 2000 years ago to make it the common era? Nothing. The reason why we say 2020 is because we are marking it from the birth of our Lord. What's so common about that era 2,000 years ago? What took place 2,000 years ago that begins our calendar that we use? The birth of Christ. So when you say CE, you're robbing Jesus of his glory. When you say BCE, you're robbing him of his glory. 
the hell with the satanic agenda. May Christ destroy it. We will glorify Christ and we will reclaim everything for Christ. It's B.C. and A.D., folks. Exactly, Ninos. Uh, Ninos, I didn't hear your voice message, so if we're going to go, let me know. Now, with that said, let's focus. Let's focus. And shame on those Trinitarians, and may God have mercy on my brothers and sisters, shame on those Trinitarians that use BC and CE to appease liberals who hate Jesus. Shame on every one of you. You disgust me. May the Lord have mercy on you and me. Because I've heard Trinitarian scholars say BCE and CE. Pathetic, man. What are you guys doing? Sleeping with the enemy so you can get the respect of the enemy in academia. The hell with academia. May God destroy the satanic, <clears throat> academic, scholarly field whose aim is it to rob Jesus of his glory. Come on, man. Be serious. Now let's focus. Sorry, guys. That's why they say I'm an angry person. May my anger bring glory to Christ and not shame him. May be righteous anger for the glory of Jesus. Now that said, everyone, let's regroup and let's focus. Exactly, Ariel. Let's regroup and refocus. Do you understand why there's a difference in reading now? Why the English Standard Version, New Revised Standard Version, have that clause, worship him, all you gods, that's not found in other versions like the King James, because the English Standard Version, New Revised Standard Version, they're taking into consideration the Deuteronomy scroll that they found in 1947, a copy of Deuteronomy written in Hebrew before the time of Christ that has that clause. Whereas the King James and the Jehovah's Witness Bible and others they go with the later Hebrew copies of Deuteronomy that do not have that clause. Right? I want to do a part six because this was too important for me to rush over. Too important for me to rush over. So one more time. Let's look at what the New World Translation says in Hebrews 1.6. Go here. Click on Hebrews 1.6. Hebrews 1, verse 6. Click on the cross symbol. What is the verse that they point to that Hebrews 1, verse 6 is quoting? What is the verse that Hebrews 1, 6 is quoting according to the Jehovah's Witnesses? Here's the link. Guys, can you quote, click on the link and see? What does it say? Yeah, in the year of our Lord, the time of our Lord. Guys, focus for the glory of Jesus, focus. Do you see that the Jehovah Witness tells you that Hebrews 1.6 is quoting Deuteronomy 32.43, but it's quoting the Greek version. Now you're going to see why did you take so much time and why did you rant and why did you keep insisting and repeating and harping on this point? Here's why. Here's why. You ready? Because if Hebrews 1.6 is quoting, if Hebrews 1.6 is quoting Deuteronomy 32.43, you know what that means? That means Hebrews is identifying Jesus as Jehovah God of Deuteronomy 32. Here is the English translation of Deuteronomy 32.43 taken from the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's in my article. Here is the English translation of Deuteronomy 32.43 from the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's in that article. Here you go. Here you go. Rejoice, O heavens, together with him, and bow down to him, all you gods. Now let me show you what the Greek reads. The Greek version. Here you go. Here's the Greek version. The Greek version of Deuteronomy 32.43. Here it is. Rejoice, ye heavens, with him, and let all the angels of God worship him. Bam! That's what Hebrews 1.6 was quoting. The Greek version of Deuteronomy 32.43. Bam! Let me post it again. You caught it? 
Rejoice, ye heavens, with him, and let all the angels of God worship him. You see what the Greek version did? The Greek version took the clause in Hebrew, worship him, all you gods, translated it as the angels being commanded to worship God. They understood the gods that were commanded to worship Jehovah as his angels. You gods, you are his angels. Worship Jehovah. Here we go again. Why do you want me to change the subject about whether gods exist and whether angels are gods? You guys caught it? So in this older form of Deuteronomy 32.43, this older Hebrew version of Deuteronomy 32.43, it says, you gods worship him. When they translated into Greek, the translators of Deuteronomy 32.43 into Greek understood that to be a reference to angels so that God was commanding the angels to worship him. You gods worship him, and Greek ends up, you angels worship him. You got it? Now, who told you that Hebrews 1.6 is quoting Deuteronomy 32.43? Who told you that? The Jehovah's Witnesses. Who told you that? The Watchtower and Bible, Bible and Tract Society. They told you that in their note. Here it is again. Click. They're telling you that here Hebrews is quoting Deuteronomy 32.43, specifically the Greek version. Now, you know why that's a damning admission on their, uh, on their part? A damning confession on their part? They're telling you that Deuteronomy 32.43, where Jehovah is to be worshipped by all the gods, meaning all his angels, is Jesus Christ. Bam! Jehovah Witness, game over for you. You got it, Hapsa. If Deuteronomy 32.43 is a command to angels to worship Jehovah, and that passage is now applied to Jesus, where in Hebrews 1 verse 6, it's the Father telling the angels, all you angels worship him. That means Jesus is the Jehovah God of Deuteronomy 32.43, whom all the angels must worship. End of story, Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes, Panos, you got it. You guys understand what you just read? Let me give you the link to the English translation of the Greek version, which even the society said is where Hebrews 1.6 is citing. Okay, watch here. Let me get it to you. You can read it for yourself for free. I'm going to unpack why this is a nightmare. The dig is up. Joe witnesses a satanic lie. Arianism and all anti-Trinitarian theologies are lies from the pit of hell of Satan. And the only truth is God is triune. Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit. Jig is up, repent, and worship God as he is. Stop. Stop your battle against the Trinity because you will lose and he will shame you and expose you as a liar. Enough. Here's the link. English translation. English translation. Of the Greek version of Deuteronomy 32.43. Here's the link. Okay. It's in my article, but here's the link. Go there, guys. Scroll and read it for yourself. It's too long for me to post. Go to 43 and tell me. And you can read the Greek. The Greek is to your right. So you Greek readers, read it in Greek. So the Orthodox Church, guess what's amazing? The Orthodox Church only goes with the Greek version of the Old Testament. The Orthodox Church only read the Greek versions of the Old Testament. That means the Orthodox Christians here, when they read Deuteronomy 32, 43, they see in Greek it says, let all the angels worship him. So in their Old Testament, they can make the connection with Hebrews 1, 6. Yeah, Daryl, I just said English Standard Version has it, Daryl Nutt. New Revised Standard Version has it, right? Exactly, it's easy for you guys to refute them. Now, guys, can you go there and see for yourself in 43? Read it. 
Rejoice, ye heavens, with him. Let all the angels of God worship him. Look to your right, and you'll see in your right, it's right there. It says, Pantes Angeloi Theu. Pantes Angeloi Theu. The Asmin way. All the angels of God are to worship him. Everyone got it? Pantes Angeloi Theu. And Gilu. And Gilu. And Gilu. All right. You get it right? No, Candace, I don't know if you're following me. I think we lost you. This is not their resource. This is the English translation of the Greek versions of the Old Testament that's online for free. But if you mean it's in their Hebrews 1.6 note, yes. Remember the, the link I gave you? In the 1984 edition of their Bible, Hebrews 1.6, the cross references Deuteronomy 32.43. They tell you that's where... Hebrews 1.6 is getting this command from. Hebrews 1.6 is citing that passage. Okay, now, folks, let's break it down because I'm going to have to end it here. I'm going to have to do a part six. Okay. What's the implication of all this? What's the implication? Is Deuteronomy 32.43 a command to the angels, all of them, no one excluded, a command to all the angels to worship Jehovah. Is that the context of Deuteronomy 32.43? Is that what Deuteronomy 32.43 is saying? All the angels of God who are created by God are to worship Jehovah, right? Does that include the Archangel Michael? Is the Archangel Michael included in Deuteronomy 32.43? Is he one of the angels? That Jehovah commands to worship Jehovah. You with me there? Okay. So here's my follow-up question. You got it, Daryl. So you're getting it. Okay, here's my question. Does Hebrews 1.6 quote that passage where all the angels are commanded to worship God and apply to Jesus where the Father commands all his angels to worship the Son? Is it applied to Jesus being worshipped by all the angels in Hebrews 1.6? Now, you understand what that means? Number one, Jesus cannot be a created angel because number two, he's the Jehovah God who created the angels because that passage is talking about angels worshipping Jehovah, not a creature. So if it's applied to Jesus, that means Jesus is being worshipped as Jehovah by all the angelic creatures. Why is he being worshipped as Jehovah if he's not Jehovah and merely a created angel? Bye-bye, Jehovah's Witnesses. Find you another religion, another book. Do you understand? How could Hebrews 1.6 be applied to Jesus by the Father, where the Father brings his firstborn and says, let all the angels of God worship him, my firstborn. When that's a citation of Deuteronomy 32, 43, where in that context, all the angels of God are commanded to worship Jehovah. So the Jehovah that all the angels worship is identified as Jesus Christ in Hebrews 1, God's first begotten son. Bye-bye, Jehovah Witnesses. Everyone got it? Everyone got the message? Bye-bye, Jehovah Witnesses. Surprise, heretics. Surprise, David. Everyone got it? All right. If you got it, I, I thought I was going to finish today, but no, we got to do part six. But please, brethren. You're not going to remember all this information if you don't read the articles and re-listen to this session. Re-listen, re-re-listen, because we talked about versions and translations and their import and impact and importance on establishing the Trinity. Learn the arguments. Share the arguments. Teach others these arguments until every knee bows and every tongue confesses 
Jesus Christ is Jehovah, God Almighty in the flesh, the eternal Son of the Father, the eternal companion of the Holy Spirit. That's why we're Trinitarians. And Christ is risen, risen indeed. So let me see. Okay, yeah. Lord willing, I'm going to be back on tonight with a special session. If you guys can stay up, 12 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 12 a.m. New York Time, which will be not too early for Europeans. It should be around 6 a.m. in Europe. So other places is going to be afternoon. So join me, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Invite others because I'm going to talk about the miracles of Jesus Christ. The miracles of Jesus Christ, their significance, their import. Well, Magdalene, hopefully you'll wake up at 5 a.m. and you'll join us. So that means it's now 20 to 6 a.m. In about three hours, God willing, I'll be live again. The miracles of Jesus Christ, their significance, their import, and what we can learn from those miracles. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. You are truly Jehovah Almighty. The eternal son of the father, eternal companion spirit, worthy of the worship of all angelic creatures and of all creation. And you will be worshipped and no one will rob you of your glory. As long as you give us breath, holiness, and fill us with the spirit, we will be zealous to glorify you by your power, for your glory, by your grace, using us. And we will let the world know you are almighty Jehovah the eternal Son of the Father, eternal companion of the Spirit, and we love you, Jehovah Jesus. Yahovah, Yeshua, we love you. Bless us and save us. Bless my daughters. Save them, please, and bring them sooner than later. And save us from Satan, his children, this world, and from our own sinfulness. Uh, sinfulness. And Lord Jesus, give me the freedom to serve you. Do not allow anyone to hinder me. And save us from failing you in Jesus' name. Yeah, Allah. Father, Son, and Spirit, we love you. See you guys in about three hours, Lord willing, 12 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Do what you got to do. Pray for the session. Invite people. Hopefully we'll have a blast. Christ is risen, risen indeed.